uh, migrants who are then being asked to get out uh, by the candidate running for the Rotina Party. <clears throat> um, the surveys that I did in, in the last uh, three, two, three years, I conducted a series of uh, systematic opinion surveys throughout the Russian Federation, uh, almost 6,000 respondents uh, in uh, uh, using Russian national samples and also representative samples from various Russian provinces. Uh, and uh, one question I asked was the one that I stole from the Eurobarometer uh, surveys, uh, which is never asked in the United States surveys because I think it's considered to be too politically incorrect in the United States. Uh, but in Europe it is asked, and, it, and, and the question is, um, do you agree with the statement that all migrants, legal and illegal, and their children should be deported to wherever they came from. Uh, in the European Union, about 18% uh, of respondents agrees with that. Uh, in the Russian Federation, on average, about 45% of respondents agreed with that. And in cities like Moscow, you had the highest rates of agreement. In Moscow, it was over 50%. In fact, in fact Moscow and Primorsky Krai were the two uh, areas where that uh, view was the strongest. By another measure, I also asked you know, a parallel question because often uh, this kind of view is challenged and sociologists say, yeah, you know, people will tell you that, that they oppose, that they support deportation, but then they will say, but we support migration too. So I had a question on whether respondents agreed or disagreed with the statement that all immigrants should be granted permanent residency in Russia no matter what. And the opposition to that was actually even stronger than the support for wholesale deportation in Moscow and Primorsky Krai. Again, it was the strongest, and it was probably about 20, 30 percent strongest, so about 80 percent of respondents saying, under no circumstances, you know, we want immigrants to have these rights. We, since we talked about Tajikistan here and Tajik migrants, I wanted to give you some uh, insight on um, another manifestation of immigration attitudes in Russia. Because uh, I had a specific question uh, in uh, the 2005 uh, wave of surveys, uh, which dealt with reactions uh, to the murder, very brutal murder, in downtown St. Petersburg uh, of uh, a, Taj a nine-year-old Tajik girl. She and her father were walking down the street in the middle of the day. About 20 skinheads attacked them. They uh, killed the girl. The father was hospitalized with serious injuries. And so um, I asked uh, in the survey <clears throat> what respondents wanted to do when they, when they heard these kinds of stories, when they hear these kinds of stories from the media. One option was, I want to defend members of ethnic minorities myself. And about 3.9% of respondents in the Russian Federation <laughs> said, yeah, we want to do that. Um, Another one was help the police defend ethnic minorities and find the perpetrators of these crimes so that they could be brought to court. About 12.6% said yes. Uh, about 30% said we want to demand that our government spend more money to fund the police and security services to defend ethnic minorities. But the majority of respondents, 48.4%, opted out for this. They said demand that our government make tougher rules for migrants' entry into the country and movement within the country. In other words, they were blaming the victim. They were saying that the reason why we have all these gruesome episodes of violence is because we have too many migrants and they move around too freely. So if we restrict that, we will see less of that bad stuff and that would be the best way to protect uh, the migrants uh, themselves. So. Um, Let's go back to, uh, to the slides. Uh, now, about rural versus urban, I did uh, uh, run a quick test to see if there was any statistically significant correlation uh, between the um, perception uh, on, uh, views on migration by urban and rural residents, no statistically significant correlation. But if you run the same analysis by the population size, then you actually see that there is some statistically significant correlation. It is more of an urban problem. More respondents living in larger cities are likely to say that Russia for ethnic Russians is a sensible, good idea. Uh, so that exclusionist sentiment is more prevalent 
in larger cities. However, the interesting thing, and that's why this chart is better than simply the regression coefficient, is you can see that uh, where you score uh, on this correlation is on the, uh, this ascending kind of scale uh, in, by various population size units from completely disagree to mostly agree. But then completely agree, it kind of drops off. However, if you look at smaller population places, then uh, there are actually a disproportionately higher percentage of people saying they completely agree with that statement. So you do have perhaps overall more of an urban problem with xenophobia and violence against migrants, but, but more potential for extreme acts uh, of violence in smaller cities. Perhaps in the Russian version of what some American sociologists called micro-urban areas, which are not exactly the metropolises like Washington DC, uh, or the rural areas uh, somewhere in Montana, uh, but uh, places uh, in between. And um, I think we can talk actually about the emergence of something that I may describe as systemic community level ethno-religious violence in Russia. This is just a snapshot of that from 2004, 2005. I have systematic data sets. And by the way, these data sets and the survey that I described to you are on my web pages and they're not Hillary.com. They are <laughs> on my home page at San Diego State University under migration and ethnic conflict. You can get to all this data there. Uh, but 594 events, including a lot of uh, events resulting in assassination, murder, grievous bodily harm, and that of course is just a fraction uh, of the total number of events, but it's based on the two most, most systematic and reputable sources of this kind of data collection, the SOVA uh, uh, Analytical Center and the um, Union of Councils of Soviet Jews Bigotry Monitor. Uh, that uh, they both have networks uh, of reporters in all regions of the Russian federations that supply uh, this kind of data. Um, in St. Petersburg, uh, we also saw that these kinds of skinhead activities are not necessarily disjointed, that there's been some coordination among them when the police uncovered the uh, manual called a Guide to Street Terrorism, where, which detailed specific acts of violence to be perpetrated against migrants and foreigners and which the police found actually correlated very strongly with the type of assaults and the type of physical bodily harm uh, that was uh, administered, so to speak, to the victims. Um, all right, so uh, now we had also a question on uh, to what extent this relates to the economy. Uh, and uh, I must say that, you know, the economy certainly does play uh, an effect in that, but not straightforwardly. If um, you compare, for example, the views uh, on Asian migrants in Russia, on the Chinese, the Vietnamese, and the Koreans, uh, in five different provinces, uh, you look at Moscow City, uh, which has the unemployment rate, which had the unemployment rate in 2003 of, say, 1.3%. Uh, and the per capita income reported uh, at 16, almost 17,000 rubles uh, a person uh, a year versus, say, Orenburg Oblast, where the unemployment was 11% and the per capita income was uh, 3,000 rubles. But the level of support uh, for deportation of all migrants was almost twice as high in Moscow than as opposed to Orenburg. So it's not necessarily prosperous places it's not necessarily economic prosperity that is going to drive down uh, ethnic hostility. You, you find a lot of that in Russia. You find uh, places that are uh, not as prosperous, uh, with, not, with, with more unemployment, uh, that are a lot less hostile uh, than places uh, with higher economic rates of development and less unemployment. Um, what I think uh, is interesting here, and in, uh, I just recently conducted uh, and that's why my head was spinning. Uh, 64 regression tests uh, with, uh, by, by looking at these five regions and all of these Asian ethnic groups uh, and various ethnic groups among respondents, how they viewed them. And I found only two variables, but I did find two, which was remarkable, I think. Uh, that in pretty much all 64 tests, in 59 to 63 out of 64 tests, those two variables were statistically significant. And they were these questions. The first question was, uh, do you think 
uh, immigration makes Russia stronger or weaker. So that is association of migration with the strength or weakness of the state. Uh, and the second one was do migrants take away jobs? So somewhere at the juncture of the perceived efficacy of state institutions, uh, state authority, and how that is translated into economic opportunity for the local population, I think is the answer. The interactivity of these factors probably drive a lot of these anti-migrant expressions of uh, hostility. And that is related also to the demographics. Because a lot of time the way people translate these things is, is the rates, differential rates by ethnic groups of how ethnic composition in their provinces changes. So I'm going to show to you the positive side of that. Now despite of all this, so the job market and the state strength, if these things can combine together uh, and um, if, if they do not weigh too heavily on the minds of respondents. Maybe we can get something going. Uh, when I started doing my research in Primorsky Cry in 99, I, I recorded... You should tell people where Primorsky Cry Primorsky Cry in the Russian Far East at the juncture of China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, and there were lots of stories of this mass Chinese migration, which I didn't find, uh, despite all my best efforts, uh, even walking around all these markets. Uh, but uh, the thing was that they were very high levels. About 60% of respondents were saying that all these tourists are creeping invaders, uh, that they're going to infiltrate and take over the Russian Far East. In 2001, uh, the Security Council of Russia changed its view. They said, you know, the, the Chinese migration was not all much of a, of a threat. We need to promote a more positive image of Chinese migration. Uh, Putin changed Governor Nostratenko. Uh, Darkin arrived on the scene even, even though he was not the Kremlin protege, at least at first. Uh, and, and he was promoting more of a business line. You know, we need to do business with Asia rather than, you know, all these uh, Chinese are going to seize all our lands. And the number of respondents, I was able to conduct a survey of, uh, which polled 400 of the same people whom I polled in 2000, polled them in 2005, that level of uh, that view that uh, the Chinese were creeping invaders declined by about 19%. So there was some sizable reduction in, in negative images. But let me show you, well, this was the Kondapoga, the, the Korean, uh, vi the, sorry, the uh, Karelian violence uh, and, uh, in, in Karelia between the Russians and the Chechens. But in the Russian Far East, you saw the emergence of these kinds of things. Even though there were very few Chinese migrants in Nahotka uh, around 2000, the expectation was that this trade will grow, and so the locals built a mile-long complex called the Chinese Wall with all kinds of trade facilities, even though most of the people trading there were the Russians and the Turks. <laughs> uh, in Usurisk, Usurisk, the second largest city in Primorsky Krai, they built a little entry called Chinatown, even though there were no Chinese inside, only occasional seasonal workers coming to work at the sugar factory. Things like that started developing. You see those uh, uh, markets uh, emerged uh, in Vladivostok, uh, and, and people started trading all these, uh, what they call shoddy goods, which they sell and then buy Mercedeses. Well, Kmart owners do the same. You know. <laughs> so uh, uh, various kinds of, as I said, chintz rules, and you can buy posters of Putin and Tartu, uh, the Russian uh, girl uh, homosexual pop group became very famous. Uh, but gradually, these facilities started to develop. If you observe them over the years, gradually they're building up. Uh, the containers where they used to live are now transformed into uh, kind of larger buildings. And then the kind of street market that you saw on the first slide is now looking like this, a trade center, Bachurin. You see the same Chinese traders inside, but it's a different structure. And this uh, colleague of mine whom you see on the slide, uh, Professor Plaksen, from Vladivostok with whom we did these surveys, he, he kept saying as we walked through these markets and areas, he said, you know what, what I think, yeah, we have all these problems, we have all this rhetoric, we have all this xenophobia, but when you observe this growth, I always say, rynok živet i pobeždayet, the market lives and wins. And I emerged with a strong sense that the market, given a chance, will live and win and uh, perhaps we will even see the emergence of some interesting 
um, micro-urban communities in deeply rural areas in the Russian Far East, driven by this market demand, such as this trade and economic complex, which is built right across the border between Russia uh, and China. Uh, the Russians, of course, built the Orthodox Church made of wood, the first thing, just to make sure that it will stay Russian territory. Uh, but you see the construction of this complex on the border, and this person was the former governor. And then, of course, perhaps one day we will even see this in the, if, if we get the positive forces of the market and a stronger, more effective state um, give, the, give a chance to this process. Thank you. Well, I'm quite impressed, Misha, that you managed to end up on a positive note from where you started off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say, okay. Uh, okay. Couldn't, couldn't make it all that gloomy all the way. <laughs> Caroline? Okay, wait, I need the... There you go. Okay, well, um, thank you, Blair, for inviting me back to the center. It's always um, very stimulating to be here. Um, I have been um, working for quite some time um, on immigration issues in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, um, which is one of these new gateway cities of immigration. Um, um, some of you may know that with Audrey Singer and Susan Hardwick, we just published a book out of the Brookings Center on 21st Century Gateways. Marie Price has uh, co-authored an article with Audrey in that book. Uh, and then, of course, there's another essay that I have in the book that was just announced this morning that uh, Blair and his colleagues edited uh, here. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about um, these uh, uh, new cities of immigration. Uh, do I just point this and go? So um, in the immigration to the United States that's happened particularly after, well, you know, after 65, after 1980, after 1990 in particular is when things really started taking off. And if we just look at the, uh, at, at the numbers, uh, then of course um, still these traditional cities of immigration that date back to the 19th century, if not earlier, are, are still receiving areas. So cities like New York, uh, cities like Chicago, uh, cities like Los Angeles, which comes into the foray really after World War II, uh, and equally cities like Miami, and they are just passing through those um, uh, through those quickly, of course, then you just sort of see the proportion of the foreign-born, whether it's in the city uh, itself or in the larger metropolitan area. But I think those of us who've been working on um, trends in U.S. immigration are very well aware that other things have been happening since 1990, uh, so that you get a lot of new cities that, that my colleague Audrey Singer um, at Brookings um, has labeled emerging gateways, um, and Dallas is in that category. Washington, D.C. is, which we'll be hearing more about in a bit. Atlanta and Dallas-Fort Worth are, are there in the emerging gateways. Actually, the comparisons between Atlanta and Dallas I find particularly interesting. Uh, and then um, uh, in the 21st century gateways, we have these pre-emerging gateways, which we think by now are actually probably already emerged, uh, but uh, in the so-called New South, uh, places like Charlotte, and, and uh, Michael has been working in the North Carolina area most recently. At least he was telling me that at, at lunch. But um, uh, those states of the New South is another trend. Uh, and then a third third trend is the impact of all of this on suburban America and the city like the one that I live in, uh, the DFW metropolitan area is the better way to talk about it, uh, or like Atlanta, but these cities along the southern stretch of the United States, but I suppose also Washington, D.C., um, uh, where really what we're talking about is the greater Washington area, uh, the real, and listening uh, to Walter Tejeda this morning, of course, the real impact of this has been in the suburban areas of these cities, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And then, of course, um, talking about Russian cities, these smaller, what you called micro metro areas, or whatever it was that you referred to them, but of course, small, uh, smaller towns, I think. Uh, also in the United States have seen this, um, uh, this impact. So if we talk about the DFW area, um, first of all, just uh, uh, an, uh, an overview, um, uh, this, this rapid rise in the foreign born, the proportion of the population that was foreign born, that doubled between 1990 and um, uh, 2000. Uh, and then 9-11 uh, uh, was a little bit of a blip, uh, I think, across the country on all these matters. But when you start looking at the ACS data from 05 or 06, uh, it picked itself back up uh, pretty quickly so that there's also a growth uh, trend, perhaps not as dramatic because of what happened in the early part of the, 20, uh, the first few years of the 21st century. But nevertheless, it really has um, continued. Uh, the big unknown, of course, is what our current 
economy uh, and economic situation is um, going to uh, do to all this, let alone all the other things that are going on in this, uh, in this country. Um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area has attracted both uh, high and low hum human capital uh, populations. So um, uh, the Indian population is in the top six. The Chinese population is in the top six. Uh, the Korean population in the top six, um, uh, more or less higher human capital in terms of education and some of them coming with, uh, with uh, uh, income. And then, of course, everything that everybody associates Texas and, and Dallas and, and the other cities with, uh, which is, of course, the large, um, the large Hispanic population, particularly Mexican. Uh, I think it's particularly interesting when you look at these um, cities just to, and this relates back to maybe the issue of why a Walter Tejeda can, can move ahead as fast as he has in the Washington, D.C. area, um, which I'll get to in a minute. Of course, it's a much um, um, uh, more spread out, but the Salvadorans are the largest immigrant population in this area. Area. And if you want to sort of think about that in terms of how individuals then enter the political process and then bring people along uh, with them, looking at the composition of these populations in different metropolitan areas is uh, particularly interesting. So, of course, there's the pie chart for the DFW um, uh, area. Uh, naturally, the Mexicans are the, are the largest. Um, but and it's you know fairly diverse, but there are significant. And the, the top six really are the top six, um, uh, or the top four, I guess I should say, are really the top four. Then if we get to the D.C. area, uh, the, the the dark blue is other, uh, which again speaks to the the real diversity in the Washington D.C. area in terms of populations. But then that lighter blue right next to it is the Salvadorans. So just in terms of the way that we look at cities and we pose this question of what is the impact of these newcomers on cities, um, to deal with this issue. Of composition is particularly important. I'm not telling anybody a story they don't know here. Uh, the light blue there is Cubans uh, in Miami. And of course, we all know the history of, of, of the, 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 the power uh, that, that Cubans have in the Miami area, in the political process, in the economic process, uh, and a lot of other things uh, going on in, the, in that area. And then just to take one of those traditional gateways, um, uh, 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 first of all, that um, uh, I, I'm not so sure that it's in the common imagination about how large the Mexican population is in Chicago, because I think we still live with a legacy of the, the history of Chicago. But second to the Mexicans are the Poles. Um, and of course, post-65, the Poles again re-entered uh, re Chicago. And certainly when I was living in Chicago in the 80s, Eddie Verdoliak was on the city council. And a very powerful, I guess alderman it is in Chicago, a very powerful <laughs> alderman from the, um, uh, uh, the Polish commu community with his constituency. So if you're you know, interested in things like political incorporation, um, I think looking at these kinds of things as we compare across cities, and it's certainly been something uh, that it's a little too early in terms of, but as we're watching this begin to grow in the, in the DFW area to sort of um, uh, look at these kinds of issues. Um, it was, uh, there was a question this morning, I think to um, uh, Patricia about Toronto, uh, that had to do with um, ethnic enclaves. And I think the other thing that we need to pay attention to, uh, here's the old Chicago model of settlement into cities with the 19th century migration where immigrants come into the center of the city over the course of time, first generation, second generation, third generation, they move out into the suburbs. Well, the Im important point uh, that we certainly make in our suburban 21st century gateway cities is that, th that what has been going on uh, in the last 10 to 20 years um, is direct settlement uh, in the suburbs. So for those of you who are not familiar with the DFW area, uh, this is what I call the DFW metropolitan area or the DFW metroplex. Um, of course, Fort Worth and Dallas uh, being the two major nodes. And there are a bunch of suburban communities uh, around the metropolitan area. Um, you may have heard of, uh, and I'll come back to this in just a minute, Farmer's Branch is uh, one of the, uh, the communities that has been very much in the news uh, in terms of the laws that has, it has been passing. Uh, Anti-immigrant legislation um, constantly challenged. Just recently, the the, the Supreme Court th uh, threw threw it out, uh, and they've now got a new one. They're they're waiting for the the next lawsuit. Um, uh, Irving uh, Irving is 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 another one, and you can see that. So if you look at um, the, the figures here, these are what I call the inner ring suburbs, particularly around the city of Dallas and Fort Worth. And so you see, they're just in terms of the proportion of the foreign, um, the proportion of the foreign born 
uh, uh, and I guess I just did it from 2000, so these numbers have increased as, uh, from ACS uh, data. But there you see a quarter of the population of farmers' branch is foreign-born. Uh, and uh, again, if you just think about those numbers and then think about the reactions. And by the way, the city councilman leading the, the anti-immigrant charge in farmers' branch has just been elected mayor. Um, and so uh, I have been thinking about, and actually Audrey and I have had some conversations about this re recently, about the important of, importance of key individuals, of leaders in communities who can, we've had a lot of discussion today about discourse, and they can um, uh, formulate the discourse, um, and then people will jump on board. And so it's very interesting to watch this particular community and what's been happening that they've now elected him, um, elected him mayor. Irving is the other one, and, and you can see it's in 2000, slightly above a quarter of, of the uh, population <coughs> were foreign born. Just to say, uh, these are further out, outer ring suburbs. Denton is where the University of North Texas is. This is quite far away, but nevertheless, uh, those outer ring suburbs have equally had very powerful um, uh, foreign-born settlement in the last few years. And I'm not going to go in it today because I'm going to really talk about the impact of the foreign-born on the landscape. But uh, again, I know another theme today has been talking about how local communities and local governments respond. And I've just talked a little bit about Farmers Branch. They're not all negative. Uh, and in the article, the, the chapter I have in 21st Century Gateways, I talk about a, a, a second case where it's a much more inclusive, enlightened response. And I think those of us working on this and with uh, the responses of local places have found a lot of, diff of diversity in the ways that local communities have responded. Um, and we certainly can do more about that. I just wanted to show you, again, on this enclave and, and settlement, again, another theme today, when people have shown maps, and there was one, the, the maps of Russia, uh, of Moscow, were a good example of, of looking at um, settlement patterns of different groups. This is um, based on the 2000 census, all the black is, is Mexicans, right? Uh, so pretty much all over the metropolitan area, concentrated on the southern side. There are developmental dif uh, development differences between North Dallas and South Dallas, uh, that kind of thing reflected in, in there. This is the settlement patterns, and now it turns to white, um, so if you can see it, of the, the Indian population in those, and Plano is a very interesting community. That's the community I discuss as my more inclusive um, uh, 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 local government response. But you can see this kind of arc of Indians in North Dallas, uh, in Collin County, which was one of the fastest growing counties in the United States, um, uh, in the 1990s, a, a very wealthy uh, suburb, so it's attracted those high human capital Asian populations. But again, in this kind of um, arc of population settlement. Salvadorans, um, uh, the second largest Hispanic uh, group after the Mexicans, but there's a big uh, uh, n numeric difference. But they're sort of concentrated cl you know, in, and actually Irving and, and, and Farmers Branch are there with, uh, with you know, pretty high proportions of, Salvador, uh, of Salvadorans. Uh, so following a little bit the Mexican pattern of, of settlement, but, but really closer into that Dallas metropolitan area. Uh, the Vietnamese are particularly interesting, because there, if you see the white, there are really two concentrations. Um, that the Vietnamese, of uh, the five groups that we looked at in this study funded by the National Science Foundation, they're the most enclave, they're the most concentrated. And I think that's a particularly interesting story in terms of the, the, the history of Vietnamese uh, of Vietnamese settlement, but there's a real concentration. We too have an Arlington, um, and it's right there. It's a sort of mid city between Dallas and Fort Worth on the southern side. If you see that white clump there, and then in the in the inner ring suburb of, of uh, 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 Garland. So just to move on to some issues. Um, um, one of the things I've been interested in, it relates to a question, I think the gentleman's not here any longer, but he asked about sort of impacts on the urban landscape, and particularly cultural impacts, and so that's what I thought I would talk a little bit about, uh, about today, uh, and, and also steer you to some concepts that I have found, I think, particularly useful uh, in, in thinking about that. First of all, the whole notion of placemaking, how do new populations um, make place, especially when they are uh, dispersed. Uh, um, you know, where's the cent where's the there there? Where's the center? Where's the concept? Where's the community? How do they? What does community even mean when you've got uh, that kind of dispersed settlement? Uh, and and that context also thinking about we've had a lot of you know globalization has been thrown out, but I think there's this counter trend of localism. You know, we've written a lot now about globalization. Let's come back and think about localism and locality. That needs to sort of re uh, re uh, uh, re enter um, the concept of community and something I've been working on 
recently with my colleague Deborah Danahay, another anthropologist, is, is dealing with uh, concepts of civic engagement. So in doing this, um, here are some concepts that I have found useful drawing out of the literature and thinking about some of these things um, uh, from Stephen Castles, uh, a, a well-noted immigration scholar, re-territorializing identity at the level of the city. How does one sort of claim and, and, and uh, indicate identity and identity in relationship to place? Uh, the concept from geographers, my, my, all my friends uh, who are geographers of, of heterolocalism uh, from Zelinsky and Lee, I have found particularly useful, especially dealing with a dispersed population like the Asian Indian population, um, that, that they are dispersed in terms, but they, they, they create um, uh, 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 centers in various diff uh, in different ways. And then from Rosaldo, um, Renato Rosaldo um, and uh, William Flores, the concept of cultural citizenship, and of course that's uh, Iwa Ong, somebody else who's weighed in on this, but I actually like their understanding of, of cultural uh, citizenship, which gets to this issue of the right to be different, the right to maintain ethnic or cultural difference, but that doesn't mean that people don't feel like they belong politically, and that you can become um, um, uh, uh, politically incorporated and yet still retain these cultural differences, and we need to start separating those things and, and, and get away from, as I think most of us who work in the field are, from straight line um, uh, assimilation and think about this in much more complex ways. So in terms of space making, and this goes back again uh, to the comment about Toronto, um, there are and it's not just DFW, it's true of the Dallas, of the uh, DC area and, and the, certainly the Atlanta area. One of the ways that these new immigrant populations dispersely uh, settled have, have made place is through these strip shopping malls. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a little bit like the last slides that you showed in terms of, of the market. But these are um, uh, very distinct. Um, uh, you could do a tour of the city of Dallas and move from the Korean one to the Vietnamese one to the Indian one, et cetera, et cetera. But they are very definite markers on the urban uh, landscape that have really changed the city in ways that I think half of Dallas doesn't really realize because there are these issues of, 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 of and they're, they're not conscious. What I call the Highland Park bubble of Dallas, which is the, the rich Republican zip code, excuse me. Um, but they're not aware of, of what's really happened in, uh, in their city. They're kind of in the center and they don't have a sense of what's been going on in the periphery. Uh, we've had some discussion about the importance of associations. Again, it's something I'm working on much more recently. Next time I'm invited back, I can <laughs> give some more um, data on uh, on that in the DFW area, but these are very important. And again, if you pay attention and you drive around the city, uh, you will see these kinds of uh, organizations. This is the Indian one uh, founded in 1963. It's been there for quite a long time and is very important to the Indian community. Of course, all the religious institutions, which are at the forefront uh, of what I call civic incorporation. I um, mean, it is, it is through religious organizations that people really learn how to be civically involved, and it's the first step, I think, towards um, some broader sense of incorporation. These are extremely important and all over the landscape. Uh, international festivals um, uh, are, uh, again, sometimes once a year events. They happen in a lot of the suburbs around the city. They happen in the city itself. This happens to be the Plano, it, pictures of the uh, Plano International Festival. Uh, and then other kinds of national days that, that um, various immigrant populations um, uh, celebrate. And this happens to be the Anan Bazaar, uh, which is on Indian Independence Day in the middle of August. Can you imagine that in the DFW area? And they take over the racetrack. So the, the Lone Star racetrack becomes uh, Little India for an afternoon and evening, and there are about 25,000 Indians who gather you know, once a year at that place uh, and feel like they're at home. But it has a commercial. I mean, all the various entrepreneurs in the city come and have booths, uh, various mainstream organizations. Um, I have seen voter registration going on at the Anand Bazaar. All kinds of things go on at these events that I think are important to pay attention to as we look at the impact on the urban landscape. So again, in terms of things that we want to think about as we look at um, uh, the impact of, of uh, immigrants on cities, uh, what's their cultural presence like those festivals, uh, what's their civic presence like those uh, organizations, and then what's their political presence as they move from civic presence to political presence, and that's something that I've been looking at more recently. I wanted to at least um, uh, finish with three uh, slides, one to simply comment on something that hasn't been mentioned today, but when you think about dispersed settlement and immigrant populations, uh, we have to think about new technology and the, and the communities that can be created, the internet neighborhoods that are created, and these are not only um, uh, 
um, local, national, they are of course also transnational. Uh, this one, uh, the Eknazar, which means a glimpse, is an electronic bulletin board founded in Dallas um, and it has now gone more national, but it is absolutely vital to the incorporation process of new Indians who come. They learn about it fairly quickly. Uh, they can buy, somebody's returning to India wants to sell all their furniture, they buy it, they put it into their new house, uh, cars are bought and sold, jobs are procured, uh, comments on events are posted on this. So it really, um, this is a very important, now that we have this technology thing to look at in terms of uh, how it creates a community. Uh, a second to last slide, just commenting about shared spaces, that I've been talking a lot about the religious institutions of particular groups, the voluntary associations of, of particular groups. Uh, I had asked that question this morning about pan-ethnic organizations, uh, and one needs to pay attention to those because there's, a, there's another level of interaction. So there's just a, 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 a few of them uh, that exist um, uh, that, that are, are shared spaces or pan-ethnic spaces um, uh, you know, that involve more than one ethnic group that are important to pay attention to. And then finally, where I end my essay in, in um, uh, Blair et al.'s uh, uh, book is just to, to raise, and here I draw from um, an analysis by Joan Weibel Orlando, who actually did a study of Native American Indians in the Los Angeles area. But she has a very interesting discussion um, that makes one think about what one's talking about when one talks about the concept of, of community. And there are lots of different ways to enter into to that discussion and to enter into the sense of community and what an immigrant community is. Uh, and so, uh, you know, here's just uh, a lot of different ways that we can think about the immigrant community and that, that the uh, immigrant populations themselves think about it. So there's sort of analytical coming uh, together in terms of, uh, uh, you know, these, these various kinds of, uh, of approaches to these new forms of settlement and to the ways that these new newcomers have impacted urban landscapes like DFW. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, uh, you're on. Am I looking for something on here, or do you have it on? No, I'm not going okay. to actually present any slides. So okay. um, I don't know whether this is good or bad. I don't have any pictures to uh, sort of keep you all awake. Um, but I, I appreciate um, you all. Just be sure to use the microphone. Right. I appreciate you all um, stick, sticking around for the, this, this last presentation. Uh, and I'm in a sort of tough position of, of uh, in some ways being last because I, there's so much rich stuff that's been presented and talked about beforehand, so I have to uh, keep that in mind. Um, but I want to start off by uh, returning to the point that Blair raised at the very beginning, which is that uh, one of the central narratives of the 20th century and, and going into the 21st is the migration of people uh, into more densely settled areas. So uh, two, two trends coming together, uh, urbanization and migration. And this is really, uh, I think, what's, what has tied the various presentations here today uh, together. Um, and that although these two trends have been uh, quite important, quite central, that they're often uh, uh, sort of overlooked, overshadowed, uh, ignored in much of the discussions um, about sort of both national and international politics, We've, sort of urbanization is uh, overlooked. Uh, and this is true of the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, the U.S. experienced uh, urbanization uh, earlier, perhaps, than some of the places we've been talking about today. Uh, so by the mid-20th century, the U.S. was largely um, mostly urban. Uh, but um, urbanization in the U.S. has meant something slightly different. It, it's meant, uh, in part, dispersal away from central cities. Uh, so uh, the EEOC did a ranking of urbanization um, across the, uh, uh, sorry, the OECD. Um, and the U.S. has uh, the least urban concentration among uh, all uh, OECD countries. But they're defining uh, urbanization as a central city uh, concentrations. So one of the things that's happening in the United States um, is that we're a very urban nation, but uh, not a very, uh, not, we don't have urban concentrations in central cities in the way that, that some other countries do. Uh, so we're seeing uh, simultaneously sort of concentration and dispersal. Um, and you see this in the figures about, about Americans living in, in <coughs> suburbia. So about um, more than half now of all Americans live outside of what the census defines as central cities, um, these kind of stereotypically white middle class uh, enclaves. Um, uh, but those stereotypically white middle class enclaves are becoming increasingly diverse, as Caroline was pointing out earlier, that uh, the old patterns that we thought of uh, where 
uh, immigrants and, and ethnic minorities would move first to central cities and then slowly disperse outwards uh, has been turned sort of topsy-turvy uh, since the 1980s and sort of accelerated since. Uh, so that now uh, more than half of immigrants themselves live in suburbs. Uh, and um, thanks to the suburbanization of immigrants, you see uh, the increasing ethnic and racial diversity of suburbia. So uh, more than a third of, of African Americans now live in suburbs, um, just about half of Latinos, uh, more than half of Asian Americans. Uh, so there's, again, this dual phenomenon of residential concentration, uh, sort of increasing density, but dispersal from central cities. Um, in some ways, what you're seeing in the United States is uh, a move to a more uh, European donut model of urbanization, where the central cities be become increasingly upper middle class. Uh, then there's an inner, inner ring of, of suburbs uh, that are more, um, well, middle, middle to working class, and then an outer ring of suburbs or, or exurban areas where uh, the, these metro areas are, are expanding. So that, for instance, now in Washington, D.C., the metro area includes places as far away as uh, parts of Pennsylvania, parts of West Virginia. Um, I mean, we're talking about, about uh, uh, people commuting 150 uh, to, to 200 miles to, to get to uh, their place of work. Uh, so the conception of what we think of as urban has, I think, radically, uh, is radically changing. Um, so this raises all kinds of questions about, about what we mean by, by integration or incorporation. Um, uh, so as you have these ethnic and racial minorities moving into these suburban areas that are very, uh, very dispersed, um, how does this change their experience of politics, uh, their political opportunities, uh, the opportunities for mobilization? Uh, so one argument is that as these suburbs become more racially and ethnically homogenous, then they become more city-like. They begin to grapple with the same kinds of issues that cities grapple with. Um, so uh, poverty or, or uh, um, trying to provide low-income housing or crime or, or uh, providing services uh, many in many languages. And so this leads to the rise of a more contentious, uh, although some have argued, uh, more actively engaged citizenry. Um, but uh, I would argue that uh, although uh, you have these changes that in some ways begin to um, echo the, the issues that are raised in central city areas, uh, suburbia has a very different kind of political space, I'm sorry, very different kind of uh, physical space um, that, uh, again, this, this, this pattern of, of dispersal, these strip malls that people drive by and don't notice what's going on, uh, this is, I think, quite typical of uh, this kind of suburban sprawl. So you have increasing ethnic and uh, racial diversity um, that in many ways uh, can be invisible. Uh, you have a political fragmentation, uh, which is something we really haven't talked about. So we think about cities as being uh, central political units. But again, when you have this dispersal, uh, particularly in the American system, uh, where a metropolitan area, uh, say the county of Los Angeles, which has almost 100 different municipalities, uh, the county of uh, Miami-Dade in Florida, which has, uh, I think, close to 70 municipalities, and even the D.C. metro area, which has uh, about 20 or so municipalities. I mean, talking about, about political fragmentation as well as spatial dispersal. Um, and these things have, I think, real effects for the, how we think about integration and the pathways to integration. So the, uh, the, the larger paper that this talk is based on uh, has sort of three different themes, uh, the incorporation of new actors in suburbia, uh, the impact of these new actors on suburban politics, and the effects of suburbia itself on new actors, so how actors think of themselves as, as, as ethnic groups, uh, how, how you think about ethnic identity when you're, uh, um, your ethnic group is, in, is dispersed across a 150-mile wide area where, there's, where there isn't that same kind of residential concentration that we think of in the Chicago school where you had a, a Polish neighborhood where all your central institutions were basically two blocks away, uh, your church, your clubs, your, your ethnic food stores, your schools. Uh, uh, here we're talking about, uh, about physical locations where uh, your church is 10 miles in one direction, your ethnic food store is uh, 20 miles in another direction. Um, and, and so we're talking about a complete uh, physical dispersal of the ethnic community. Um, so uh, this, I think, has sort of implications. The first is that you'll see uh, variation across, across uh, policy arenas. That is, whoops, um, that new actors who are going to experience politics and political incorporation differently depending on the political arena that they're engaged in. So whether it's uh, th uh, th uh, through the school board, uh, through uh, planning boards, through 
uh, through electrical po uh, electoral politics. And the second theme is that you're going to see uh, a variation across uh, different suburbs. Um, so that th these changes are going to be felt differently by suburban location, uh, so inner suburbs versus outer suburbs, um, and by institutions. So uh, one of the things I focus on are, are Dillon's rule states versus non-Dillon rule states. Uh, that's a, not something that any, any of you are probably familiar with, but Dillon's rule refers to the kind of a th the authority granted by states to localities, uh, say, to raise taxes. Um, uh, a strict Dillon's rule state like Virginia uh, allows very little leeway to its localities to, to uh, raise its property taxes, uh, whereas in other states um, give a lot of, quite a lot of leeway to its localities to uh, raise taxes, shift spending, uh, and this varies widely in the United States. So in a federal system in particular, you're going to see a lot of variation across localities. Um, and third, there's going to be a lot of variation across different ethnic and racial groups, which is something we've talked a bit about today. So uh, I want to talk about each of these uh, three briefly, sort of variation across policy arenas, variation across states and localities, and variation across uh, ethnic groups. And I hope I can keep to my time. Um, so uh, political scientists tend to think about uh, incorporation as electoral politics. And I'm a political scientist, so I you know, often fall into this trap. Um, <laughs> but uh, electoral politics is only, of course, one arena uh, for a civic and political incorporation. And, Again, Caroline has mentioned uh, NGOs and churches. I've uh, written quite a lot about, about bureaucratic incorporation, so the ways in which local bureaucracies incorporate uh, immigrants, uh, whether through uh, uh, um, health services or, or education or, or public libraries, which are one of my favorites. Um, uh, depending in part on how these different bureaucratic institutions see their, their mission uh, and the relationship they build with, uh, uh, with their clients. So uh, there are some bureaucratic institutions which build uh, sort of longer term relationships with, with, their, with, uh, with their clients. Uh, again, libraries are, are a good example, uh, versus other bureaucratic agencies that see their role as primary regulatory or rule enforcing, uh, so like the police. Uh, and these can have sort of very different kinds of, of, of integration through these different uh, bureaucratic institutions. Um, uh, if we think about politics as strategies directed at the redistribution of public goods, um, immigrants can choose different means uh, to accomplish ends. Uh, so they can uh, choose uh, electoral po politics as a pathway, bureaucratic politics as a pathway, uh, mobilization through community organizations as a pathway, uh, and seek different partners uh, in the, uh, the receiving in the, uh, context, so again, different bureaucratic actors as partners. Um, uh, so we shouldn't think about integration as simply being sort of electoral and, and, uh, electoral participation, uh, because it, it, uh, what an immigrant group or, or an individual in the immigrant group considers to be integration depends on what they want from the institutions. So they, um, uh, it may, they may just want symbolic recognition. Uh, they, they may want, just want to have a, a national day celebration. Uh, that may be all that they want, um, at least in the short term. Or they may want uh, to elect a, re elect a representative, which of course leads to a very different pathway. Um, they may want uh, simply to, to have a certain policy put in place or, or some amount of public spending that would be directed at their group, again, leading to a very different kind of mobilization. Um, variation across, across place, um, which uh, I mentioned briefly, the Dillon's rule. Uh, there's a whole other uh, set of uh, policies which are being uh, implemented differentially across, across the states and across localities. Uh, as you all know, the federal government uh, sort of failed to pass immigration reform in 2006 and 2007. Uh, as a result, uh, a lot of these decisions about uh, how to handle immigration are being uh, devolved down to the states and localities. Uh, uh, Farmers, Branch. Farmers Branch is one of them, yes. Um, uh, Prince William County uh, here in, in the D.C. area is another. Um, uh, uh, these localities are making decisions, for instance, on how to uh, enforce uh, national immigration law, uh, deciding whether or not to enter into agreements and partnerships with the Department of Homeland Security through Program 287G, which is uh, basically an agreement between local uh, law enforcement uh, to uh, become deputies of the DHS and apply uh, and enforce uh, immigration law. Um, but this leads to, again, incredible variation uh, across localities. Um, uh, so I think in the interest of time, I'm going to not talk a, lo a lot about variation across ethnic groups, uh, although I'm perfectly willing to, to talk about that. 
Um, and then finally, I want to conclude by, by raising three kinds of questions. Um, uh, I began by talking about, about suburbia in the United States, uh, about urbanization without cities, uh, or urbanization beyond cities, and how uh, this has implication for decision making. So you want to ask, so if you have this kind of dispersal, you have this kind of fragmentation, then what is the locus of what we think of as civic engagement or politics? Um, what are the implications for service provision? How do we coordinate, uh, how do we think about the, the coordination of response and managing uh, the management of change uh, through immigration? Uh, so there, these are all uh, have implications for incorporation. So how you bring these diverse residents into civic and political life, uh, and so uh, there's a larger question I think for us here, which is uh, the world has been urbanizing. Um, uh, is urbanization best captured by a focus on on cities? Uh, so would regions or provinces or um, broader metro areas be a more appropriate focus? Uh, and so the question really is, what do we mean by urban? Um, Second, um, uh, sort of related, uh, is that we, there's a whole set of new patterns. We've been talking again about Washington, D.C., Moscow, Barcelona <coughs> as uh, global cities, but we're seeing migration as well to these smaller locales. Again, uh, both uh, presenters on this panel mentioned this. Uh, so Misha talked about um, uh, the, the public opinion in these smaller, smaller areas, rural areas, um, and uh, Caroline mentioned this as well on these, these smaller uh, municipalities around the D Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, I'm part of this Im uh, New Immigrant Destinations Project where I just came from North Carolina. Um, uh, uh, we're looking at Chatham City, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chatham County, uh, Siler City in Chatham County. Uh, has uh, three uh, poultry processing plants that uh, have been there for a while. As the city became majority Latino uh, sometime in the 1990s, a very rapidly uh, changing uh, county and city. Um, so in some ways, if you talk about globalization and global cities, uh, Siler City, North Carolina, which has 8,000 people, is in its way a global city. Um, um, uh, and, it's, and it's quite fascinating. You get the, the overlay of, of, immigrant, of immigration on these older uh, relationships of race between blacks and whites, uh, <coughs> and then simultaneously as well, uh, because uh, Chatham County is on the fringe of the larger Rala Durham, uh, the Chapel Hill um, sort of metro complex, I suppose. Uh, you have both sort of yuppies and old south, uh, old southern politics and immigration sort of coming together. It's quite fascinating. Um, um, so uh, again, we're going to see these, these variations by locale, uh, uh, where, where states and localities are making decisions, uh, uh, where decision-making power is located in different places, uh, not just at the nation level, at the, at the level of the nation, at the level of the state. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, uh, or, or who's making decisions? Is it the county? Is it the city, the municipality? Um, uh, and if we look at place, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is the importance of place? Um, so the importance of place could be institutional, or where decisions are made. Uh, it could also be, as was suggested in the morning panel, uh, a matter of physical infrastructure, so where housing is located, housing segregation, um, access to transportation, location of schooling. Uh, so how we think about space uh, and locale can be conceptualized quite differently. And so we should ask ourselves, I think, uh, how and why does place matter? Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit also as well about uh, pathways to incorporation, which I, was, uh, I mentioned I was going to say uh, that vary by group. Um, and we think about, about pathways to incorporation as being sort of linear and unidirectional, so you move from less integration to more integration. Um, but I think there are two other possibilities. One is that there's no movement at all, so you, uh, you don't move to the, whatever your goal is, uh, however you conceptualize integration. Um, and the second um, uh, is that, that integration may be, it may have sort of uh, <coughs> cul-de-sacs in integration. Uh, so um, where you have a sort of incomplete or partial membership that, that where people get stuck there for quite a long time. Uh, a very good example in the United States is uh, temporary protected status for Central Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a group of people who are here presumably legally but can never never get out of that status. And they're, they're neither illegal nor, nor can they move to permanent citizenship. They're just stuck. Um, uh, and uh, or or so that's a, where, where legal status uh, can can matter, uh, or or where you get symbolic integration but not substantive integration. So um, example of that might be sort of you end up with festivals, or you end up in New York, for instance, with um, 
uh, the city recognizing alternate side of the street parking for Hindu holidays. Um, I mean, that's very nice, um, but uh, may not actually be what we think of as being integration. Um, uh, and, uh, and so you may end up with, with what uh, sort of a, a political parallel or civic parallel to, to how the sociologists talk about segmented assimilation, where uh, depending on your class status, depending on, on the pathway you, uh, you as your, in your group embark on toward integration, uh, some groups may, may succeed and other groups may, may uh, have sort of less um, beneficial outcomes. Um, so uh, we have sort of better and worse results. And you can argue about uh, what results we should think of being as des what, we sh what results we should think of as being desirable and what we may think of as meaning better. But I, I do think that there's going to be different, uh, again, variation in the kinds of outcomes that immigrants and immigrant groups experience. And so again, the larger question here is, what do we mean by integration? So we've been talking a lot about integration uh, in, this, in this workshop, I think without actually sort of saying what we mean. Um, and I think there, there are lots of different ways that you, that you can think about integration. And, and um, um, so the, I raise these questions in a more general way uh, um, based on my experience uh, in research here in the US and, and in the Washington DC area. But I don't think that these questions are specific to any one site. Uh, and I think one of, the useful, uh, uh, one of the useful things about getting a group uh, like this together uh, is that we bring together people who look at these things from quite different perspectives and, and uh, across uh, cases uh, and, and really make us think about what our starting assumptions are. And so I want to, thank, I want to end by thanking uh, Blair and others for, for bringing to us together. Thank you. I know it's late in the day and it's terribly hot in this room, um, and I apologize for that. What I'd like to do is to take oh, 15, 20 minutes for questions, and then we'll we'll wrap up. I already see one hand. Go ahead, Dan. <clears throat> right over, right over here. Uh, uh, Dan Kazmer, uh, research associate, Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. This is just a suggestion uh, for Professor Bretel. Um, you have very interesting potential cro uh, I mean, cross-section time series data on ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. And if you plug that into the Case-Shiller equations to determine real estate values, oh. you're going to get oh, yeah, a lot sure. of play and have big effect. And boy, this is the time to do it. I'm going to get back. You know, it's actually some real estate organization asked me to talk to them in the fall. So I need mm -hmm. to get with you about this data set. <laughs> Wayne? Thank you. Uh, I'd like the, the last two speakers to comment a bit on the role of a factor that wasn't explicitly mentioned, which is congregation, m meaning religious congregation, mm -hmm. both for immigrant groups, how congregation, whether it be Hindu or Roman Catholic or whatever it may be, plays a role in providing community identity in these very dispersed, dispersed communities. I mean, you mentioned the internet, but it strikes me that religious Oh, Congregation plays an enormously important role, but also how community plays a role in these m urban multiplexes. I mean, something I keep trying to explain to my European friends who simply cannot comprehend it is that you can have a religious congregation in which people come from all over an enormous area, and the only thing they have in common is the congregation. Mm -hmm. They come from different communities, they come from different walks of life, they come from different socioeconomic status, but the, the congregation is an enormously important unifying factor. And it's one of, I, well, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why the United States remains a much more religious country than most other developed countries. Mm -hmm. But I, I haven't heard that explicitly mentioned by any of the speakers. And I'm wondering if, if you think it's as important as it seems to be to me. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I was skating over a lot of stuff here, trying to throw a lot of things at you about the way, you know, conceptually I've been thinking about this and about the institutions. but. Um, the religious institutions I see as, uh, well, first of all, they're one of the organizations that solves that problem of, of heterolocalism, where you've got a dispersed settlement. I have the same things as Michael has been talking about with, you know, these dispersed populations. And so um, it, it, by group, it varies how far they come to congregate. Um, there's also transformation. If you take the Indian case, for example, where in India, uh, I mean, you don't have one temple day. 
right? Um, the adaptation here is that Sunday becomes the day at the temple, and so people come because they're leading their American lives otherwise. Um, and so, yes, they, they come together. Now they will go individually, you know, during the week if there's some special holiday or some special prayer they want to say for somebody in their family but but uh, though and that's across I mean the the, the Buddhist and and Christian um, uh, organizations for the Vietnamese community that obviously the churches whether they're Protestant uh, fundamentalist or they're Roman Catholic for the Mexicans but but just as in previous waves of immigration religious institutions are absolutely the, the you know, key community centers, and lots goes on. And and my argument in this new project, or with Deborah, and again, I think there's there's been a study done in this area by Foley and Hoge, I think, on religious institutions. There are a couple of really good books that have come out, in the, maybe a half a dozen of them, really focusing on this issue for the new um, immigrant populations. But you know, we're trying to look at these as the first. Um, the front line of learning how to be civically engaged. Uh, in other words, when you build a religious institution, you have to interface with local government. You have to buy the land. You have to learn. You have to learn how to file for a 501c3. Um, you know. So if we think about, and I agree with Michael that we have much too narrow a definition of what political incorporation is, and we're trying to break it out. As I gather, you know, as I gather, he is. Um, so, um, you know, I just didn't have time to do it, but I think it's fundamentally important. I don't know what you want to add. Uh, just very briefly, that I think uh, uh, these hub institutions that bring people together from a wide uh, dispersed areas uh, are different by ethnic groups. So churches are central for a lot of different ethnic groups, but uh, not for the Chinese. Um, uh, and I think there are other institutions which also play this role. Soccer leagues, I think, play this role for Salvadorans. Uh, Salvador yeah. uh, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> not just Salvadorans. Yeah. Right. Um, but there are other kind of these hub hub institutions. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions. Kathy and the woman there. We'll come up here, and then we'll take Aaron and the woman over there. So, Kathy. I'm glad Wayne brought up religion um, because I, I was thinking of the Russian example. Uh, if one thinks of uh, uh, the Putin's administration, obviously is re-centralizing. I think uh, there are more and more indications that the Russian Orthodox Church is increasingly going to be deployed, for want of a better term, perhaps, um, as a way to overcome what the government is obviously very well aware of the declining pr percentage of the Russian population being ethnic Russians, and that membership in the Russian Orthodox Church will be the sort of the, the um, key to uh, being more equal in Russian society, perhaps, than other groups, or most likely than other groups, and that it will not necessarily depend on ethnic background. Um, we'll have the question right here, and then we'll come up. Hi, I was wondering if all the panelists could address how um, you would factor in the activities of the sending countries of these different migrant populations, as many of them are getting more engaged, both in the U.S. and other countries, of trying to organize their diaspora or either stay engaged with them or get them more engaged politically. Ten years ago, when I did research with Ecuadorans in New York, the Ecuadorian uh, government had basically created a partnership with the, the Catholic Church to try to uh, use that as one way of accessing promotion of, you know, registering to vote and learning English and other things, but also staying connected to the Ecuadorian community. So I was wondering if you've seen that and how that factors into um, your, how you're looking at these issues of assimilation or integration. Maybe what we'll do is we'll start with Michael and Caroline. I think, Misha, you may have something to say about this last point as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, the, the the success that that sending countries have had when keeping touch with uh, and building these kinds of partnerships with their with their communities abroad uh, varies enormously. So uh, a lot of a lot of sending countries have paid lip service to this idea, and they put uh, very different levels of resources into into building up these ties. Um, the, the case that's attracted a lot of attention is, of course, Mexico, uh, which has built up a. a <coughs> A network of uh, consulates across the U.S. Um, and my, many of them in sort of these new immigrant destination areas. Uh, so Raleigh Durham, for instance, has a has a Mexican consulate. Um, um, but 
Yeah, this is there, so there's there are different points of view about about how transnationalism interacts or intersects with assimilation. Um, um, I I tend to think, and from the data that I have and that I've seen, that, that transnationalism tends to fade away across time in the U.S. and across generation. So, um, but it's a complicated argument. Well, um, no, I mean, I, I would say I haven't looked at it systematically, but you know, I started my um, my career as an immigration scholar working with the Portuguese in Canada and in France and, and then spent a lot of time in Portugal. And, uh, you know, uh, the Portuguese in the 60s and 70s, the Portuguese state was doing this very powerfully. Now, of course, for the first part of that research, you know, the Salazar regime under Caetano was, st at least when I entered into my research, was still very much alive. But, um, you know, that was one of the early powerful remittance <laughs> states. Um, and Portuguese banks were, you know, in Canada, in France, you know, funneling those remittances. So this is something that's gone. And I'm making that by saying this has gone on for quite a long time in different immigrant populations. And, and perhaps, you know, certain states wake up to it faster than others in terms of prosperity. You know, the Indian government not only has passed through dual citizenship um, to allow people not to vote in India, but to at least keep property, which kept a lot of people from taking American citizenship. Uh, but they also have an NRI, non-resident Indian ambassador. Uh, and then the other comment on the Mexican, of course, is, is the consular card, you know, that the Mexican consulate steps in and provides an identity card, you know, um, uh, that, that facilitates, I mean, you know, that they're kind of negotiating this. So uh, I, it's not something that, I, it's a very important question. It's a very important topic to look Look at. I agree with Michael that I, you know, I'm not sure um, where the tra you know, some of it will be sustained um, in, in terms of people maintaining interests or investment in their home country depends again on the group, maybe into the second and third generation. But uh, well, for as long as of course there's new migration, it'll be sustained. Um, I just before going on to you because this was really your question, but I just want to do it in terms of the comment about Russia. You know, it interested me all day that um, there wasn't more discussion, uh, particularly in the European context, and I assume in the Russian context, in, in some cases when you're talking about those minority populations, about Islam. And, and um, uh, Islamic um, immigrants and, you know, that becomes a point of contention as it butts up against in some countries that are, you know, 99% Christian as, as a country like Spain is, and I don't know if our Spanish colleagues still here, um, you know, because a, a lot of these things, the other thing we haven't discussed today is, you know, what this presence is in terms of a challenge to people's identity, and that's a cultural question, and there was somebody this morning who was trying to formulate that, that, that question. Uh, you know, I always ask my students, they say, the American culture, I say, what is that? And I think the Farmer's Branch conflict it, it's not about Islam, but it is about American culture, and it's about middle class American culture being challenged. And so, when you put up that slide about the watermelons, was it you or was it somebody? Yes, yes, yeah, I did, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I mean, it's not watermelons, but it's houses being painted pink. Um, you know, so uh, anyway, that's a lot of different things I was throwing in, but. Okay. Well, that's this is a wonderful uh, lead up to my comments because I did wanted to comment on the orthodox church question, and if I understand your question correctly, you say that the demographic situation is such that it's, you know, it's going to force the Orthodox Church to be more inclusive, right? Was that well, the implication? One way of putting it, but the government, I think, is also, shall we say, encouraging. I, I can go into okay. That. Well, you know, I, I would just have to say that looking at my survey data, because I do have the religious differentiation there too, they still have a long way to go. There is a very strong correlation uh, between uh, the um, uh, frequency of church attendance uh, among the Russian Orthodox believers. And in the survey, about 66% said they are Orthodox believers in the general Russian population. Uh, and these questions on exclusionism, you know, support Russia for ethnic Russians, support deportation, quite a strong correlation. The only time that I personally experienced anti-Americanism in Russia, because I am a Russian-American, I'm a hyphenated right, Russian when I go to Russia, that, and, and, and usually you know, people, people have no problem with it. I even had a wonderful conversation and drank vodka with Zhirinovsky supporters on the train once. But the only time that I experienced very strong 
anti-American anti-Americanism personal eye to eye was in Pskov region in Pechora Monastery where I struck up a conversation with a local priest who was about to lead the tour of the caves and we had a wonderful chat until he asked where you are you from and I said I'm from Seattle in the United States and he just looked at me as if I came from Mars turned away and never spoke to me again even though he conducted the entire tour so you know anyway just maybe on Islam um, I had a separate survey of minorities uh, and Muslims <coughs> on how they view migrants and how they view Muslim migrants and non-Muslim migrants and actually um, to cut the long story short uh, if you control for ethnicity the effect of Muslim non-Muslim practically disappears uh, the only difference is uh, that the um, Muslim non-Russians are more likely to support wholesale deportation of migrants than non-Muslims, non-Russians. That's, an, that's, that's the, the strong statistically significant finding. On sending states, uh, somebody asked the question. Um, I can just uh, say that in my view, there, there is a, you know, these things can go on parallel tracks. And in, in say, the Russian-Chinese case, uh, in terms of perceptions, uh, the, the perception that China is that rising power in Asia uh, that can back up these migrants uh, and use them as a vehicle for putting political, economic pressure, or even territorial claims on Russia has been strongly correlated with anti-Chinese sentiments in the Russian Far East. As one Russian governor summed it up, from Russian migrant to Russian migrant labor from much Russian uh, from Chinese migrant labor in Russia to Chinese cultural center from a Chinese cultural center to a Chinese business from a Chinese business to a Chinese soldier period so you know you you, you had these sorts of views but however on the other track on on that you know landscape track there has been a lot of collaboration even under a very xenophobic governor Nostratenko in that maritime Primorsky territory. They had joint, they had you know, police meetings, uh, uh, border guards meetings, they, they had a visa-free travel regime, uh, they had uh, lenient trading rules, uh, and that cross-border trade probably was twice as much as the officially uh, accounted for uh, interstate trade. Uh, in, in that region. So, you know, you see, you see a lot of the same dichotomy and the same paradoxes with the sending states, I think. Okay, I think I, I, we'll have three final questions and then we'll begin to wrap up. Erin, uh, the woman back there, and the Peter Savrakis. Uh, so this is a question to Mikhail. When we've been talking about U.S. migration, one of the things that's really come out today is how incredibly diverse the response to immigration has been across different U.S. communities. The difference between Farmers Branch and, and Arlington, Virginia, is there just seems to be some people get really angry and feel really threatened by immigrants, and in other communities that sense of threat is just not so strong. In your discussion of Russia, I didn't really see that kind of community level variation in um, opposition to immigration. And I'm wondering, does that exist in Russia? And if it, if it doesn't, then why do you think the US and Russia are so different in this instance? Right there. Thank you. Uh, Sally Stoker, American University. Listen, I want, had a question for Misha, sort of follow up on your research uh, in the Vladivostok region. Um, Regarding the Chinese, I'm wondering, do you have any data or have you looked at the extent to which Chinese students are enrolling in programs in the Far East State University or some of the other universities there? And is there any hope that that might help offset some of this xenophobia and, uh, you know, the, the red scare or the white scare or whatever <laughs> is going on there? I just, you know, I've also spent a lot of time in the Russian Far East and I know of that xenophobia. And I'm just wondering, I also wondered, how would you compare, for example, the Vladivostok Primorsky region to other closed cities in the former Soviet Union? I wonder if that is sort of a marker of xenophobic societies, just ones that were closed, you know, in the Soviet region. And the final yeah. question, Peter Savrakis. Oh, is it on? Yeah. Uh, I, Yes, I'm Peter Savrakis, National Defense University. 
And I guess I had a question for uh, um, the panelists talking about America. Um, the, the, the United States actually, at, at its foundation, went through this discussion about what, what is integration. They just said, what is faction, and uh, sought to avoid it. Uh, and so the, the entire structure of the system uh, is constructed so that that is allowed to have this, this cultural citizenship, as one would call it, uh, while, while preventing these independent feelings to threaten <coughs> the integrity and the, the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the processes of, of commercialization, which was really key for it. But um, I, I wonder whether in, in hearing about talking about urbanization, which now falls across county lines, across state lines, uh, whether, um, whether that system is really capable of, of handling uh, what we have today, uh, and also the religion which was brought in. Uh, I, I was actually interested in religion, the Islamic religion from the American side. <laughs> Because um, uh, I live, as it, as it happens, in, in an area which has a lot of Muslims, uh, and um, uh, and there's uh, obviously theoretically uh, the the room to create uh, liberalism for various religions, but in practice, um, it it hasn't worked out that way. And whether whether that practice is is something that, that can be corrected um, because it seems that the size of the urban areas and what they are have fallen across the boundaries of what the old system was and that might create uh, problems uh, and uh, the religion uh, is now interpreted as including uh, Islam and in, in, including uh, Hindu and inc including Buddha when when in in the, in the times that it was discussed, it was not. Okay, Misha, why don't we go to you first, and we'll, and we'll move down the panel. Okay. Um, the question on community level variation. I uh, presented some aggregate numbers, but there is actually a lot of variation, um, and it's very similar to the United States. I think um, when I think of this variation, I often think of the case in San Diego County, where there is the city of Escondido uh, that decided to uh, enforce all these anti-immigrant rules, and then the city called National City, uh, who decided to be a migrant sanctuary. Uh, National City is a lot closer to the border, where a lot more people would actually complain that, you know, all these illegal immigrants are sleeping in my backyard. Escondido is removed, <laughs> much harder to get to, uh, but a lot more kind of anti-migrant hostility in Escondido versus National City. And I found a very similar thing in Russia, in, in Primorsky Krai, for example, if you uh, stratify the sample by uh, locations closer to the border with China, they're less hostile than locations farther away, farther inland in, into the province uh, from the border. So it's the people who are not aware of you know, the real situation, who think of the, in, in general terms, tend to be more hostile. And, and there is this variation in Russia too. Uh, on the students, uh, and I actually, if I could open this, I do have the data. There aren't all that many students. You know, maybe a thousand or so in Primorsky Krai, I don't know. But, uh, but they are there, and uh, however, I think that um, in, in, it, it, it doesn't really, it may not necessarily depend o on whether they're students, and if you have students, they will necessarily promote some kind of benign uh, cross-cultural understanding and environment. Uh, some of the recent uh, cases of violence in Primorsky Krai were against students. Uh, and also in Moscow, uh, that uh, famous Gupkin Institute, the oil and gas institute, clashes between the Kazakhs and the Chechens, you know, also involves students. Student populations can be very volatile, if anything, because you deal with a lot of young people, especially males with testosterone. You know, so, uh, but, um, but at the same time, I would say the context of where these students are is probably the most important. The guy whom you saw on the slides, the former vice governor of Primorsky Krai, um, who is in charge of this trans-border economic and trade uh, project, um, also envisions putting in business schools and universities right there where they trade and, and go to restaurants and entertain themselves so they can learn each other's laws. And he said to me, even if 
Primorsky Krai becomes 99% Chinese. But as long as the Chinese understand and know the Russian rules and laws, I don't care. Let it be the, 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 the uh, Russian, you know, Hong Kong. Um, yeah, I, I'm not so sure I understood the full complexity of all your questions. I'm going to let Michael deal with the urbanization, and there was a, a lot in there, and I was trying to follow it very, um, very closely. I, so let me just make a few um, comments. Um, this is going to sound really simplistic, but um, you know, in 1855, um, we had a Know Nothing party that was anti-Catholic because Catholics weren't supposed to belong to the United States. The United States was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and we got beyond that and you know a absorbed Roman Catholics into this country. And I think that's really the history of this country is the history. Of, uh, that's why we've been so successful. That we've, you know, allowed Hindus to come and practice their religion. We've we've allowed Syrian Orthodox um, uh, 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 Christians from southern India to come and practice their religion. We've allowed, you know, Buddhist temples and uh, you know whatever else. I mean, so and I actually think that. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about the United States and its religious diversity in comparison with what we've been talking about a lot today, which is these countries that are experiencing this diversity in immigration for the first time, or it doesn't have that historical depth. Um, uh, you know, and, and you know they could learn from us. Um, I've thought a lot about what the volume means outside of the city of Paris. Uh, somebody said this morning uh, about we don't want to. Who was it? The Russians don't want to ghettoize the, the the immigrants. You know, the French were saying this in the 1960s. <laughs> Got to disperse them around the city in these habitations à loyer modéré. You know, these huge apartment buildings. And now there's a problem that they've created in these suburbs because actually they created these ghettos. You know, in these uh, in these buildings, so um, uh, yeah, uh, these are kind of random thoughts, but I, you know, I think we need to hold on to the fact that we've had enormous success as a country, and that's why I pose the question: What is American culture? You know, there is this middle class culture that doesn't like pink houses in your suburban neighborhood. That's you know, that's normative, but you know, American culture is an incredibly complex, fluid, changing. Um, thing, um, and so I think that's you know helped with our, suc our our success. The other comment I would make too is just going back to what I said about you know you quoted on, on cultural citizenship. I really think it is important for us to think about this process of integration and incorporation as multifaceted. Um, that that to be a good American citizen, you know, uh, does not mean you cannot go and pray at your Hindu temple. Um, uh, it doesn't mean, and, you know, if you've never been to, and I'm, by the way, a naturalized citizen from Canada, but if you've never been to a citizenship ceremony, you know, I mean, it is incredibly moving. And I think, you know, everybody who's anti-immigrant should just go to one of those ceremonies, you know. Uh, and so I think people are operating, you know, in anthropology we talk about situated identities, you know, and we're all made up, and we're all made up of different social locations. I mean, I'm a gendered person, I'm an aged person, uh, I'm an immigrant person sometimes, uh, you know, and, and these things come out, you know, we're all incredibly complex that way. And as we think about these in sophisticated <coughs> theoretical ways, how we communicate that to the people in the street and farmers branch, um, you know, I'm not sure. And the other thing I would just say, and then I'll, I'll close, that, that has fascinated me about the discourse in Farmers Branch and the discourse nationally is, um, is how much the, the, the phrase rule of law has emerged as what makes us American. Um, you know, I, I just, I don't have any answers to that. I'm thinking about it. But I think it is absolutely fascinating how that has jumped to the forefront you know, of what makes us American as, you know, as a nation of laws. I mean, you hear it from time to time, but it's very powerful right now, and, and what that means in terms of this debate of immigration. Anyway, that's just a Mark, okay. interesting. Uh, I, well, I think you were referring to, to Federalist Number 10 and the, the, the dangers of faction. But I think that the dangers of faction in Federalist Number 10 were being pointed out in Federalist Number 10 were basically concentrated faction, where uh, the kind, uh, so what we built in the U.S. Uh, is uh, through the federalist, uh, the federal system, federal, uh, where the power is dispersed through the federal government, the states, and the localities, um, is a system that's designed to um, break up faction. Uh, <coughs> and to that extent, if, uh, going back to my comments earlier about how we have 
uh, immigrants that are dispersed across metropolitan areas that have 60 different um, municipalities. Um, that is as true today as it's ever been, where the system and, sense and, and the work, if you're thinking about it from the point of view of, of Federalist Number 10 in Madison, uh, the system works. We have a system that, that fragments um, communities, that fragments identities, that, that uh, disperses people. Um, so you shouldn't be concerned if you're coming at it from that point of view. Um, I, I, I think it raises again this, this question about, so when we think about <coughs> place and where people uh, end up, one municipality rather than another, one state rather than another, so what is it about place that's important? What, what makes place matter? Uh, and there are at least two or three different ways in which the people here at this, at this workshop have talked about place mattering. Uh, so again, partly a sort of ethnic concentration or a physical infrastructure or uh, where I would probably come from is uh, sort of institutions. The inst institutions vary in the United States greatly uh, across localities. Um, and these lead to different kinds of outcomes. Where if you're an immigrant, it can be in an unfriendly place uh, or a friendly place, sanctuary cities or, or enforcement of uh, uh, national, fed uh, national immigration law. It makes an enormous difference. But the system uh, in, in our structure is, is designed for fragmentation. Um, um, again, I, I think it's something to think about in com thinking about comparisons with other countries, whether other countries, uh, local institutions and local fragmentation matters as much as it does in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to bring uh, this long day to a close, uh, more or less on time. One announcement for the participants, if you have any questions about um, uh, re we plan to regather this evening. Please be sure to see either Liz or I think Lauren was walking around before you leave, so we don't have any confusion about tonight. Um, this has been a very rich discussion, and in the one hand, it's a very typical discussion because what we see is the longer the conversation goes on, the more complex it becomes. And I'm struck with the words tend towards abstraction, which is mm -hmm. to be expected given that most of the speakers, and not all, but most of the speakers are um, academics. But the visual images beginning with the crowded Barcelona train station platform and the Somalian women, young Somalian women in Johannesburg and the people on the train uh, continuing on through. People have chosen images with the exception of Olga's picture of that ad about labor force, which really didn't reflect her views but the view of Russian policymakers. People chose images which I think communicate the humanity of the problem and the challenges that are being faced in many different places around the world, in many environments in which they haven't been faced before. And I think uh, I am drawn by those powerful images that have been shown uh, throughout the day to go back uh, to Sue Parnell's point, Sue Parnell from University of Cape Town, that the only evaluation that matters in judging a community is whether or not anyone would want their own children to live to study or to work in that community. And I think the challenge that we've been talking about today is really the challenge about creating places in which people really would want their children to be. And that's going to be a challenge with us for a long time. So on that note, I will uh, bring the formal session to an end. I want to thank everybody uh, for coming here, particularly those of you who have sat through all day. Uh, and I want to also, again, thank uh, the people who put it together, um, Lauren Hertzer, Liz